Hello, and welcome to ESG Talk, your go-to source for insights and advice from leaders in environment, social, and governance. I'm your host, Mandy McReynolds. Today, we will be replaying one of my favorite episodes from season two, featuring Charlene Lake, Chief Sustainability Officer at AT AT&T, a global telecommunications company. Charlene brings a great perspective on what it takes for companies to create audit-ready ESG data that investors and stakeholders can trust. She talks about all the lessons learned from overseeing the creation of a company's sustainability report, get this, since 2007. So let's all listen in to this candid conversation on how companies have come a really long way to earn stakeholder trust through the transition of ESG reporting from voluntary to mandatory. Let's jump in because I think AT&T's journey is remarkable. You began back in 2007. You created a new corporate citizenship and sustainability charter that became the board's existing public affairs committee and went on to launch the AT&T formal CSR efforts and platform. So can you tell us how it has evolved from the roots of CSR as you've been on this journey for well over a decade. Oh, goodness. 2007. That means that um, we've published 15 or 16 sustainability reports since then. So I remember being so proud of those first ones. And I got to tell you, when I look back at those now, it's kind of like looking back at your old English term papers in high school. They're a little bit cringeworthy. So we've, we've come an awful long way, but um, it's been a, a great learning journey. In 2007, you're right, we did bring together our CEO and our board, and we rewrote the charter to make CSR accountable at the board level. And it really wasn't, I'd like to say it was really hard to do, and I did a great job getting it over that mountain, but it was, that part was really easy because the board and the CEO recognized the importance and the opportunity. At that time, we were not measuring our carbon footprint. Our only social strategy actually was philanthropy. And in some cases it was checkbook philanthropy, uh, the old fashioned kind. So fast forward today, we do have um, sophisticated emissions programs, um, climate resiliency programs, and then our environmental and our social sustainability work is really embedded in our business strategy. So An important part of that evolution, I would say, is that 15 years ago, the function of CSR was largely a separate corporate department. And now we've really made great progress of integrating it into um, the company and operationalizing it throughout the company. So we've come a long ways. I'm proud of what we've done, but we're all on a journey, right? So it's a continuous learning journey. We have a a lot longer to go. I really value that as a thought leader, you write a lot on these topics. And in fact, you talk about progress not being impossible without it being embedded in part of business as usual. So what an incredible lesson from the time that you've had to evolve as a company. So let's dive in that to that a little bit more. How do you see AT&T accomplishing this? And, and what's some more lessons that you've learned from this experience that you can share with our viewers? You know, I like the phrase business as usual, Mandy. And to me, the most important word there is business, because our philosophy is that everything has to have a justifiable business value to it. So when we feel this obligation to make our business more successful by making sure that our relationship with the world around us is healthy, The question is, how do you do that in a business as usual way? And for us, it was tying that work directly to the business strategy and trying to bring the company's purpose to life. Let me give you an example. So our purpose at AT AT&T is to connect people to greater possibility. So part of how we do that is um, we work to help under-resourced neighborhoods get connected to high-speed internet access. But it's not just the CSR program, it's all of the company. So our government team works to promote subsidies for low-income consumers and um, subsidies for network expansion. Our product teams develop high-quality, low-cost products. And then our CSR programs 
they promote access, they promote literacy, they promote learning for those who um, are trying to learn how to get on the internet. And so when you see an employee who's tutoring a student in a marginalized neighborhood, it's not just a CSR program, it's because we're trying to teach them how to be safe online. It's all connected to that business strategy of trying to make sure everybody in the country is, is connected. The same goes for our, our climate work, our, our climate resiliency work provides data so people can develop their own climate resiliency plans, but it's also making our network more resilient. As for what I've learned, I've learned so much over the years. Probably one of the most important things I've learned is how to say no. And that was a really tough lesson. There are so many problems to tackle in this space, but you have to stay focused on what your business does really well. What's at the very core of your business and, and do those things, a few things really well. What, what I found when we didn't do that, when we lost our focus, it was like a snowball rolling downhill because you said yes to an initiative and then that led to another one and another one. And pretty soon you look back and you are so far away from the top of the hill that you don't know how to get back. So staying very focused and learning how to say no is really important. And then the other thing that I have learned, a lesson that I remind myself of every single day is to don't underestimate the importance of your employee base. We have a small CSR team and most companies the CSR team is very small and that's appropriate. We want that because we want all employees in the entire company to be looking at their work through that lens of, of social and environmental sustainability. So don't underestimate that power because in order to be a truly sustainable company, you need that employee base all focused and headed in the right direction. I value that you talk about using your superpower, right? Using what your company is good at. We talked about that in the episode in season one with another guest and leaning into this idea of what is prioritization? What is material to your business? I know when we pull in that data, our own task force, our own executive team, we just did a pulse check and we looked at the data and we started to say, okay, where have our priorities shifted or changed? And how are we rethinking about some of these material topics as we think about our stakeholders' feedback, as we think about trends in society? And there were changes that we were we made, or we looked at, well, these two topics are now merging together, right? They're, you know, one's falling off the chart. You know, as you talk to your stakeholders, you realize like, well, it's because they see it integrated in a higher priority. And so you may make these changes based on data. As you think about data contributing to your meaningful strategy and initiatives in everyday business, talk to us about what that looks like for you at at and Data and meaningful data, it actually legitimizes this discipline. So, um, you know, for our company, nothing is real unless there's data behind it. That's just kind of who we are and who, who we've been for 140 years. I think sharing that data, it builds credibility. It builds trust. It helps deepen those relationships with our customers and with our stakeholders. I think the other thing about data, when we think about data, it helps get access to capital, right? So ESG investing certainly is going through this volatile moment right now, but, but you can't deny that there are just trillions of dollars in ESG funds. And, and those investments, they don't happen without transparent and really good quality good quality data. On the environmental side, which of course is a lot easier to get data on that side than the social side, there's still some of that maturity, but it has to happen on the social side. I'll give you an example of, of how we use and share data. It used to be when we would plan our network infrastructure, when we would factor in weather, we would take a look at the 10-day weather forecast and historical weather data. And that's all that was available to any company. And so when we, we thought about that, we thought, gosh, we're spending 18 to $20 billion a year in our network. And we want that to be resilient and last for decades, right? So, so having a 10-day weather forecast was not good enough. So we started working with Argonne National Labs to get data that looked 30 years into the future so we could make smarter decisions. And then we recently worked with FEMA to take that data provide it to the public through FEMA's new portal, the Climate Risk and Resiliency Portal. So 
Others could build their resiliency plans. But here's what's so important about data and not keeping it to yourself and actually sharing it. We can't be resilient as a company all by ourselves. We are so interdependent with everyone else. So sharing that data, hopefully, then they will become more resilient. Our supply chain will, our customers will, our government will. So the importance of data is critical, but it only gets more valuable when you share it with others. I love that you took that example from an external impact perspective and how it has a mutual impact on the business perspective. And we have to start to think about these things as in tandem, as integrated. That was one disclosure we added is we see these ESG issues as integrated. They're not separate. (laughs) One of the things I love to do, because in the panel discussion that we were on together, you really talked about the financial data. So turning it on the inside to the company, the financial data and the ESG data coming together in a single source of truth. I'd love to understand why you think it's important to that right information, the data, the insights, and how you see that really driving the strategy of your company for. Can you share with our audience maybe some of the thoughts that you shared on the panel? Yeah, you know, I think that recent movement to align with finance actually is it's one of the healthiest advancements for this entire discipline that we've, we've ever had. It acknowledges that it's not just a soft science, right? So, so if we don't manage these issues, they are going to impact our bottom line. So I don't think that all of our CSR or ESG data should go in financial reports. It's not all material, but you have to understand the linkage. You have to understand how this work actually links to healthy finances and successful, successful companies. So that's why we link, for example, our ESG materiality assessment to the company's enterprise risk management, to its investor relations work, to its financial processes, and it works to the benefit of both of us. So so we're learning from these other departments inside the company, and we're making sure that our data is SOX compliance and we're learning from them. And that's like, that's really, really important. It's important to have that commonality across your 8K, 10K proxy, your sustainability reporting. It also brings, though, understanding to other departments in the company, right? It helps other departments better learn how this CSR work and your ESG data really is helping to make the business uh, successful for the long term. We talk a lot about transparency externally being so important. I think transparency internally is even more important. I'll give you an example. We spend millions and millions of dollars each year helping customers recover from disasters and recovering our network, repairing our network after severe storms. That's a business operations expense. So once we've linked though that expense to our climate work, our climate resiliency work and our emissions reductions work, it puts a long-term lens on what is once seen as like a here and now issue. So that linkage is really, really important, which is why integration with finance and legal and IR and compliance is so important. Thank you for proving the connection between those two areas. And I love the tangible example that you gave, because oftentimes people think about it as disparate. And when they start to do the proving out of cost opportunity and benefit to the company, then they begin to see the future steps forward. I'm curious because you've had to then prepare it for both an internal audit and external auditors. How did you make sure that you had the highest quality and it was fit for all stakeholders ready to pass an audit? What were some of those uh, steps or tips you can give us? Well, you know, the first thing is you have to simplify the data. I'll confess, if you will, that we used to report all the data that we could report, but not everything that is reportable should be reported, right? It has to be meaningful data. So simplify, simplify, simplify the data, but also simplify your processes. And this is where automation comes in. It is almost mandatory now that you have a a sophisticated platform for data collection and tracking 
and calculation and all of that reporting. We've begun to do that ourselves. We have 39 different data sources that we compiled manually. And so we're now automating that to reduce human error, to make sure that we improve that error checking and to just to establish greater transparency and calculation methodologies. So that would be the second thing is, is make sure that you're automated and you have a sophisticated platform and that's going to help ensure that quality data. I would also say always search for a technology solution. And being from AT&T, I could probably sound biased saying that, but you know, technology does provide some assurances. It does help you get that credibility. You know, we lead a, a connected climate initiative where we're working with other major companies to try to find ways to reduce emissions through 5G and uh, fiber technology. But we're also looking in that process for ways to do better tracking and reporting of emissions data. So definitely look for a technology solution. And then finally, and we talked about this a little bit previously, you have to have good governance. If you're going to have really credible data, you have to have good governance because your data is coming from all across the company. It flows across all departments. You need good board oversight. You need a board committee that's in charge of this work and is accountable to sustainable um, sustainability. You need your audit committee involved and integrated with the enterprise risk management system and compliance. And you need good executive, executive oversight of your ESG strategy. So those would be the things ranging from simplification to technology to governance. And that's how you can make sure that your, your data is as, as credible as possible. You talked about that internal governance. Now let's, let's take it back out. I know you do a very robust materiality assessment, a pretty deep dive. You do it every few years. There was one that was last completed. You're getting ready for your next one. I want to know, let's talk about that external governance. How are you thinking about SCC, CSRD, and how that will affect your next materiality assessment as you prepare for it? You know, I think that what's going to happen with the regulations, of course, regulations, anybody in business knows that they can be good, they can be bad. Um, one of the things that is going to be helpful, I think, is it's eventually going to get us to some standardization. And once we get to that standardization, we're going to know exactly what to focus on. So from a materiality assessment, it may simplify our materiality assessment somewhat, but we'll also be able to go deeper because of that. So probably deeper analysis deeper analysis because we're we're able to we're able to focus for others actually it may cause the materiality assessment to be broader because the regulations are coming in and saying what to focus on that they may not be currently working on i think from a a regulation standpoint we've already seen a lot of these changes begin a lot of companies internally are changing how they're working with other departments as we've already talked about they are focused more on timeliness and on auditability. And that's what automation is going to help with as we, we look to figure out how do we answer the timeliness that the regulations are going to require. It's not going to be good enough to just rely on a materiality assessment done once every two or three years. We're going to have to move faster and we're going to have to learn faster. You know, I think what won't change though in the materiality assessment or any other the, of the methods that we used to stay in tune with uh, the external market is the need for contextual information. The standards are going to give us that comparability, but some stakeholders, some stakeholders may only want what's in the 10K, right? But others are always going to want that context. And I think once you combine the data with the context, that's when you achieve really high quality communication. So that's kind of how I see it all it all playing out. You know, we'll certainly be able to have more sophisticated and deeper information as we go forward because we'll know exactly where to focus. What's well, interesting in the in between, what I'm noticing too is is some some of our colleagues are starting to put emerging topics on their materiality assessment, right? So it's like the bottom quadrants or they're putting arrows or they're adding um, dots to show different stakeholders in different, in different arenas on their maps. And so I think people are playing with design 
to answer an ambiguity. So it'll be an interesting space as we all head towards what you talked about, the consistency or the knowns. And then as stakeholders still have their demands, how do we manage the knowns with the demands and balance that? And we'll see how how it comes with that transparency. So let's end with this eye towards the future and keep going down the path we're on. What are you thinking as an industry expert ESG reporting programs will look like? Let's go 10 years out. Let's think really big. 10 years out. What do you think it will look like? 10 years out. Gosh, predicting the future is kind of like chasing chasing shadows. I would hope for certain that we have standard frameworks by industry. I would like to see that well before 10 years. I'd like to see that inside of five years, but it moves very, very slowly. And I think one of the hardest things I have to deal with is patience, right? But we have to, we have to remember in this standard space, even though we've had progress and we're not there yet. If you look back years and years ago at the financial industry, and you know this well, the SEC and Congress called on the accounting industry to put some governance in place after the 1929 stock market crash. Well, FASB didn't come into being until 1973. <laughs> So I hope it's not going to take us 45 years to get to, to get to the standards that we need. But we do have to remember we're really an industry, a discipline that's in like an adolescent phase, right? We aren't a mature discipline yet. So certainly within 10 years, you're going to see more integrated reporting. It's not going to be exclusive, but you're going to see more of it. I do think AI is going to be a, a total game changer. And again, I can't even get to 10 years on what AI would look like. I think that's going to be much more immediate. I mean, thinking about the predictive analytics, how that's going to help us set better goals. I mean, that will be phenomenal. And being able to do more with less. So think about doing our reporting, having customized reports for different stakeholders groups. That's totally impossible today in our resource constrained environment. But that's something that AI is going to be able to make possible. Our ratings and rankings, my goodness, that will be so much better. They'll be more comprehensive. They'll be more accurate. Investors are going to be able to find quickly what they want. And then AI, but just tech in general, is going to get us closer to that real-time reporting or near real-time reporting. So that to me is really exciting because instead of doing annual sustainability reports, it's just going to be performance management, constant, ongoing performance management. So we'll have probably more auditing. We'll probably have more legal action. We'll certainly be reporting more on impacts than just what we're reporting today. And I think that the maturity of that social impact reporting is really going to be so much better. So I'm also mindful 10 years from now, a lot of our long-term goals are going to come due. So it'll be interesting to see whether the regulations at that point Um, We'll have some remediation in them for the goals that aren't met. But I'm certain I will look back 10 years from now, just like I'm looking back 10 years from today and look at our reporting and say, gosh, this is kind of like a high school English essay. It's kind of cringeworthy. So there's going to be a lot of advancements and um, it's really exciting to think about. It's really exciting to live through it. Well, cheers to the future and thinking about AI to action to ambition and getting to look back another decade from now together. It's such an honor to share some time with you again, Charlene, and invite all of our listeners and viewers to hear our conversation today. Thank you so much for joining us. Such a pleasure. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Mandy. And to our audience, it is always an honor that you choose to share your time with us on another episode of ESG Talk brought to you by Workiva, the world's only unifying platform for financial reporting, ESG, audit, and risk. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to see future episodes on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. We'll talk real soon.